Hey, welcome back. How about another chapter of uh, By the Great Horn Spoon by Sid Fleischman. Today we're going to read chapter 7 and look what it's called. End of the race. Who's going to win? Oh my gosh. Let's take a look at the map. Remember last time? Oh, this is heavy and hard. They had made it around the very tip. They didn't go around the very tip. They went through the Strait of Magellan. And now they're moving up the coast. And they're heading for Peru. And they're going to try to make it to Calio. I was saying it wrong. They say it rhymes with Calio. Calio. And uh, there, of course, they're going to pick up fresh water and uh, supplies, provisions, and most importantly, coal. Well, water is probably more important than coal. But hopefully they're going to make it and head right up the western coast of uh, South America towards the western coast of North America and finally to San Francisco. So here we go, chapter seven, end of the race. Who's ahead right now? Remember? The Raven, Sea Raven. She pulled ahead because poor old Captain Swain, me and a half sunk in the water with building bricks. Bricks! I have a notion to dump them overboard. By dusk, the Sea Raven was gone. Beyond the horizon, far ahead. Chapter 7. End of the Race. When the Lady Wilma entered the Blue Bay of Calio, Jack counted 31 sailing ships at anchor. He was disappointed that nowhere to be seen was the high-riding Sea Raven. She's loaded up with coal and fresh water, snapped Captain Swain, loaded up and skedaddled. Nevertheless, smiles were the order of the day. After months at sea, the gold seekers looked upon the sunny little town as if it were Paris or London. They couldn't wait to get ashore. Hardly had the mooring lines been thrown out like bullwhips when men began to leap to the wharf. Master Jack, shall we go ashore, said Praiseworthy. I'd like that fine, smiled Jack. Jack posted another letter home to Boston. Posted means sent it in the mail. So he's mailing his sisters and his aunt again. The street thronged with sailors and gold seekers, and in the distance the great Andes rose like painted scenery. Huge mountains, huge, huge mountains, the Andes Mountains. Some of the biggest in the world. The town wasn't a great deal larger than the ship they had just left at the fueling wharf, but it was land, dry land. Jack had almost forgotten the smell of dust in his nostrils. He breathed it in like perfume. The butler and the boy rode about on mules, and the day, and the day had all the excitement of a picnic. Late in the afternoon, Mr. Ezariah Jones hailed them in a sunny plaza. Look here, he beamed. I've bought you the last pick and shovel left in town. Since the California fever started, the shelves are bare, I can tell you, and a wash pan thrown in for good measure. They're yours. Voila, said Monsieur Grant, appearing out of the crowd and dropping a pick and shovel at their feet. I have gotten my hands on the last ones in town, and a wash pan too, my friends. And then he stopped to glare at the Yankee trader, who was already glaring at him. Gentlemen, smiled Praiseworthy, I think we can safely say that you have found the last two picks and shovels left in Caleo. Calio, excuse me, Calio. They're bound to bring us luck. Master Jack and I... His words of gratitude were interrupted by the clanging of the Lady Wilma's bell, calling the gold seekers back to their ship. Hurry, boys, shouted Mountain Jim. The wild bull of the seas would be mighty glad to leave without us. But there was, a, there was a wild rush for the wharf. But when Jack turned, praise, turned, Praiseworthy was no longer standing beside him. Jack's hair very nearly stood on end. The butler was gone. Praiseworthy! The ship's bell rang through the air, but Jack didn't know which way to run. He couldn't leave Praiseworthy behind. Hadn't he heard the ship's warning bell? What had happened to him? Praiseworthy! Why is the captain ringing the bell? That's right, because it's, hey, it's time to go. We got to go. Get back on board. We're getting out of here. Why is the guy in such a hurry? I think we know. He's got to catch the sea raven. Jack, and now praiseworthy he's not, oh my gosh, this is bad. Maybe they're going to leave. Pre Let's find out. Jack was unable to move, as if anchored to the spot by the pick and shovel. He had to fight back a welling up of tears. The lady Wilma would leave without them. 
And then, from the doorway of a nearby shop, the butler appeared, tall and elegant in his bowler hat and white gloves. He carried the new pick and shovel over one shoulder, the wash pan under an arm, and a strange package wrapped in newspaper and string dangling freely from his hand. Jack had never been so happy to see anyone in his life. Hurry, he cried desperately, we'll get left behind. Not likely, said Praiseworthy. I had to stop off and make a small purchase for our good captain himself. Come along, Master Jack. Jack tried not to let Praiseworthy see that he had been close to tears. He threw the pick and shovel across one shoulder, gathered up the wash pan, and together the boy and butler hurried toward the wharf. One by one, alley cats picked up their trail. By the time they reached the ship, it looked as if every stray cat in Calio was after them. Hmm, I wonder why cats are following them. Before the gangway could be raised, at least a dozen assorted cats followed Praiseworthy aboard. In their stocking caps, the crew was too busy throwing off housers and preparing for sea to bother with the invasion of Peruvian cats. Jack dropped the heavy pick and shovel with a clang to deck and looked at Praiseworthy's package. A dead rat, he asked. Hardly, replied the butler. Cheese? Not likely. Fresh kidney? Exactly, said Praiseworth, raising the package out of reach of the cats. Captain Swain is extraordinarily fond of kidney pie. I promised to teach the cook an old recipe my great-great-grandfather used to prepare for the Duke of Chisley. But at the moment, Captain Swain was in no temper for kidney pie. The ship had taken on fresh water, but not an ounce of coal. Blast the sea raven, he was bellowing. She's filled her bunkers and piled her decks with coal. Hills of it, mountains of it, taken every lump to be had in Calio. She's made sure there wasn't a cinder left for us. Great, no coal. The sea raven got it all. Once at sea, the Lady Wilma picked up a friendly breeze. If her coal bunkers were empty, she was at least lighter in the water and went skimming along. And Why is she lighter in the water? Because there's no coal. Hmm. Might work. The Peruvian cats learned to bound out of sight every time the husky-throated boats when came along, threatening to toss them overboard. In an unguarded moment, a snap of the wind carried off Praiseworthy's boiler hat. It went tumbling into the sea, filling with water, and sank. Praiseworthy lost his hat. There's some fish looking at it. Praiseworthy was left speechless and hatless. For three or four days, he was not quite himself. He missed the hat. He hardly felt like a butler without it. But Jack thought he looked just fine. A week later, as the heat bore down on the deck, Praiseworthy began tying a handkerchief round his head. Jack liked that even better. You look like a pirate, he smiled. Nonsense, Master Jack, said Praiseworthy. Hoping for a supply of coal, Captain Swain dropped anchor at the Galapagos. But there was nothing to be had except a few cords of stove wood on those barren islands. So some islands, you've probably heard of them, they're very famous, the Galapagos Islands. And there was even less to see except the sharks in the bay. The Lady Wilma pushed on. With a rush for gold, steamers were only just being sent round the Horn to the Pacific, and fueling stops were rare. Weeks later, off the coast of Mexico, a sudden excitement raced along the decks of the gold ship. The Sea Raven had been sighted. She was lumbering through the sea, low in the water, weighted down by her extra tons of coal. They stood in enormous black piles on her weathered decks. Billy be hanged, shouted Mountain Jim. We're going to pass her up. Jack stood on the rat lines, and his heart raced with delight. The sea raven looked half sunk in the sea. Her passengers could be seen as at the rails, glum and silent, as the Lady Wilma pulled ahead. By grabs, Captain Swain beamed, doing a little jig on the paddle box. I guess if there's anything heavier than a ton of bricks, it's a ton of coal. By the time the brown hills of California appeared off the port side, the Lady Wilma was well in the lead. Meanwhile, the Peruvian cats and had Peruvian kittens. I'll drown them, everyone, swore the boatsman. But first he had to catch them. They ran for cover whenever he approached, disappearing within seconds. They found every hiding place aboard the ship and invented new ones. Jack tried hard to ignore them. 
for good luck had taught him a lesson. But in the end, he was putting out galley scraps every night. Every morsel would be gone by the morning. Jack is feeding the cats and the kittens. Dr. Buckby sent his, spent his days fishing with the line tied around his peg leg. He would drowse in the sun until a tug roused him. But when his back was turned, the fish would disappear as if into the air. The wily cats grew fatter. As San Francisco and the end of their long voyage drew nearer, the gold seekers began to trim their beards again. They packed and repacked their sea chests, they scrubbed their clothes, and they hummed and whistled and sang the same tune. I'm going to California with the washboard on my knee. Jack's thoughts raced ahead to the gold field. What would it be like? Would there be grizzly bears and outlaws and wild Indians? Certainly, he told himself, it was an untamed place, wasn't it? What was the use of an untamed place if there weren't wild Indians and outlaws and grizzly bears? We ought to have a gun, he told Praiseworthy. A gun? Why? To protect ourselves. Stuff and nonsense, said the butler. But Jack noticed the other gold seekers busily cleaning sidearms and rifles and sharpening their knives. He wished he had a gun. A four-shooter, maybe, or even an old army musket with a bayonet. You know what a bayonet is? It's like a big, long knife that you mount on the end of a rifle. And that's quite a weapon, isn't it? One bright morning, with San Francisco not more than a day's run, the bountiful winds died away. By afternoon, clouds had gathered in the sky, and headwinds bore down on the gold ship as if to drive her back in her wake. With steam in her boilers, the Sea Raven came steadily on course. By dusk, she had caught up to the Lady Wilma, passing with a wild shout of glee and the victorious blast of her whistle. Boys, said Mountain Jim, looks like we're done for. Not a bit, said Praiseworthy on his way to the pilot house. The Lady Wilma was already making a wide tack in the wind. She might be blown hundreds of miles off course, even as far away as the Sandwich Islands. The voyage isn't finished, finished, sir, not by a long shot. But even to Jack, with the wind snapping his shirt, it seemed that the Lady Wilma's luck had run out. Captain Swain would lose command of the new clipper ship building on the ways in Boston. Jack dug his hands in his pockets and glanced up to the pilot house. The wild bull of the sea didn't have a lump of coal to fight the headwinds. Jack was asleep in his hammock when he was aroused by a strange sound. At first he thought it must be Mr. Azariah Jones snoring in his sleep, or Mountain Jim, or Dr. Buckby, but they came awake too. A deep throb ran through the ship, and then another, and then a splash of the side wheels could be heard, and then another, and another. The gold seekers bounded out of their buck, bunks, some of them in their nightcaps, and collected on the deck. Sparks were flying from the funnel. Steam had been built up in the boiler. They don't have any coal. How do they do this? What's the captain burning? Said Mountain Jim, scratching his red whiskers. Cats? Hardly, said Praiseworthy above the crash of the side wheels. He gave, gave Jack a wink. Neither cats nor bricks nor spoiled potatoes, as any stowaway could tell you, gentlemen. We're carrying lumber in our cargo holds, thousands of feet of it, lumber enough to build a hotel. It occurred to Captain Swain to purchase what he needs with the ship's fuel account. Make a fine shower of sparks, doesn't it? He's burning lumber. But the race was not yet won, and Jack could sleep no more that night. He pulled on an old pea jacket, the frog-voiced boatswain had handed down to him, and stood with Praiseworthy at the rail. This would be their last night aboard the ship after all. The paddle wheels twirled faster and faster, and the bowsprit came around on course like a compass needle. It was you, wasn't it? Jack grinned. Me, Master Jack? You told the captain about the lumber. Oh, he knew it was there, but with all his storming about the bricks in the hole, I hadn't stopped to give the lumber a thought. I merely reminded him, you might say. 
In the dark of the morning, the Lady Wilma had managed to gain on the Sea Raven. The gold ships thrashed bowsprit to bowsprit, and the red glow of their smokestacks lit up their surrounding sea. More lumber, shouted Captain Swain into his voice tube. I want every ounce of steam the boiler will hold and then some. The Sea Raven, too, was making a final sprint. By noon, the Golden Gate stood ahead of them, but the extra burden of her mountains, a deck of gold coal was too much for the Sea Raven. Beat by beat her side of her side wheels, the Lady Wilma pulled slowly ahead. Wood sparks showered from her funnel. She entered the sparkling narrows of the Golden Gate and finally came out into San Francisco Bay. The city stretched out across the sand dunes like something that had sprung up in the night before. There seemed to be more ships in the harbor than houses on the shore. Let's go to anchor, Captain Swain shouted from the pilot house window. A moment later, the anchor chain went rattling into the bay and hats went flying into the air. Beaver hats and straw hats and even a cat or two. Praiseworthy and Jack gathered up their picks and shovels, wash pans and carpet bags, and peered at the golden hills of San Francisco. The houses looked like packing boxes with roofs, and tents of every description were pitched along the dunes. Gentlemen, said Praiseworthy, tugging at his white gloves, I believe we've won the race. After a 15,000 mile voyage and five months at sea, the gold seekers had arrived. Wow, they made it to California. And they beat the Sea Raven. They had to burn a lot of lumber to do it, but they did it. You know, it says they, they saw the Golden Gate, and they turned, and they went there. There's no bridge there yet. That bridge wasn't built until way later. But the Golden Gate is just a gap between the mountains where the bay comes in. The bay comes in. It's just a gap. A gate is like a gap, and it's the golden gate. Because of the brown hills of California, they're often brown because, you know, that's just how California is most of the year. So they've come through the golden gate, but don't think that there's a bridge there that wouldn't be there for much, much later. Well, they've made it. Now they've got to get out to the gold fields. Oh, man, I can't wait to see what happens. We'll see you next time. Adios, my friends.